He's worthy. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. You're beautiful, Lord. It's not like you, O oh King. How oh, bright and morning star, you shine, you shine brightly. Glory to you, O oh King. We'll come this morning with our sacrifices of praise. We come this morning to lift our arms. To give back that which you have given unto us, O oh Lord. That love that you have filled our hearts with, Lord. We want to love you back. Let it flow freely this morning. May every hindrance, everything will keep us from flowing, Lord. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Life seems to be ruled by feelings. And not as it, as it should, by faith. Faith not in ourselves, but faith in Him. Hope in Him. For He is. Our strength. And it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yes, the just will live by faith. Why? Because we are frail, very frail. In fact, so frail that we would not be able to stand the storms, the fierce blowing wind of the big bad wolf, the big bad life, if it were not 
that we had a strong, secure place to hide and take refuge in our God. You know, we are frail. Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 1, said, For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle the Greek word tabernacle skinos means made of skin a tent made of skins like was the tabernacle of Moses and yes that's what our earthly house is that's what our body is It's us covered in skin, frail, can be knocked down by a storm, can be cut, bruised. We are a frail tent. That's why we need more than just skin to be covered with. We need to be hidden where the storms cannot reach, where the blowing of the big bad wolf cannot tear down our tent, where the winds cannot reach, hidden in God's house. in God's house I spoke last week about our house becoming a home and that home was to be in God's house our tent is safe if it's in God's house because there there is refuge because his house doesn't have a white picket fence around it his house is surrounded by the most powerful impenetrable walls that evil cannot pass the Apostle John saw the heavenly city and saw it was walled all the way around. Evil could not enter. Nothing could touch because his house is a fortress. There's an old hymn written by Martin Luther. And I like to sing it. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevail. For still our ancient foe Doth seek to work us woe His craft and power are great And armed with cruel hate On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing 
Were not the right men on our side The men of God's own choosing Do you ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He Lord Sabao is His name From age to age the same And He must win the battle What truths are in this ancient hymn sung by the church through persecutions through wars through pandemics through epidemics through storms through all kinds of evil and lacks through deserts through droughts through hunger, through pain, through health, through prosperity. But you know, this hymn has been sung as a comfort by those that are just and live by faith. Whose tents are securely staked inside the fortress which is our God. That, that is where our home should be. Inside his fortress. Hallelujah. Our home should be in that fortress. And the world and the enemy will la launch his words, his fears, to try to woo us outside of the influence of that fortress. To woo us away from our security. So our tent should be surrounded by a wall. And that fortress, of course, we know where that is, God's house. It's not here on earth. It's in another realm. As we've read many times, that God would call us to his house. Isaiah 56, 5 says, even to them, he's speaking about those that have no hope. Will I give in my house and within my walls a place. And I will give them everlasting name that shall not be cut off. If they're in my house and within my walls. So that's what we should always do. Live by faith, not by feelings. Because faith will make us abide Behind his walls and feelings will make us drop down to where we are exposed to the enemy's attacks. In verse 7 it says, And them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Yes, there can be joy in the middle of trials. That's what faith does. So our lives, our houses, 
should be in that fortress. It's not a building. It's not a church building. But it can be within a building as long as it's not a building. Yeah, I know it sounds like an oxymoron. When is a building not a building? When is a building just a wall around us? How can we make this sanctuary to be just a wall around us? Solutions up there. What does this become if you take the roof off? And you look around. Is it a building? No, it's just walls. Walls surrounding us. And so like I said, we are tents. Like Paul said, our bodies are frail tents. And we need walls. That's why... When Nehemiah went to Jerusalem, he built walls, walls to protect the weak Jews that were there and wanted to rebuild the altar, the temple. The first thing they needed to abide within the walls. And so they set up tents inside of the walls. Speaking of the latter days, the apostle of the prophet Amos, in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, and it was repeated in the New Testament. He spoke about the restoration of a tent, the tent of David. The tabernacle of David. And he says, in that day will I raise up the tent, the tabernacle of David that is fallen. And close up the breaches. And will raise up the runes and it will build it as in the days of old. That they might possess the remnant of of Edom. These are the Gentiles. So he says in the last time. There will be a rising up. Of the tent. Of David. And a building up. Of the walls. The closing of the breaches. In the walls. Because David's tabernacle. Was within the walls. Of Jerusalem. There was walls. And the tent. Not the temple. But walls and a tent. And they will possess. What remains. Of the evil ones. Of Edom. Which was cursed. And of all the brethren. Which are called by my name. I remember when I received the strange instructions in April of 2016 that we were going to have what turned out to be the birth of the new generation for us. And how he instructed me to put a tent inside of a building. A tent. And that's what our house should be. A tent within a building. A tent surrounded by walls. And when Paul spoke about our tabernacle, he was making a metaphor, illustration of our human body. 
that skin where we are inside of that skin, inside of that tabernacle. That the human body in which the soul dwells is like a tent that is taken down by death. So that's why he said what I read today. For we know that if our earthly house, 2 Corinthians 5.1, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved... We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In other words, we will have a permanent building, not just a tent, a frail tent for a few years and it's gone like the grass that dries and the flower it fades. But he says we will take this essence, who we are, our souls, and we will put it in another place, but not a tent. It will be a permanent building, dwelling in God's fortress. Jesus said to his disciples, He was a builder, a mason, a carpenter. And he said, I'm going to build houses, subdivisions, condominiums. I don't know. But he says, I'm going to build a house for you. So where I am, you might be also. And so we will be given Permanent bodies that do not fade, that do not get sick, that do not hurt. But meanwhile, meanwhile, we'll have to make sure that our little frail tent is very close to where he lives. The only way Christians have been able to make it through the struggles of life will be near to the heart of God, like we sang last week, inside of those walls. I mentioned last week the scripture of Jesus that said, how man seeks security in buildings. Not knowing that, like he said to that man in the parable, you build these buildings thinking that they will prolong your life, but you don't know that your tent, your life will be taken away this very night. And who is going to live in those places that you have built? So our lives are to be spent in tents. One that we read that lived by faith and dwelt in a tent and was used in the scriptures as something that should be looked to as an example. Even called the father of faith. He owned a tent. His name was Abraham. And his tent was his dwelling as he wandered through life. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 9, it says, By faith he traveled in the land of promise as in a strange country. He didn't have any building, any earthly house, nor any title to land. It was a transportable, movable habitation. Like the one that God said, that's how I like to be when I'm on earth. 
David said, no, you're the great king and creator. I want to make you a beautiful castle worthy of who you are. And God said, no. Here on earth, in this earth, we should live in tents. Did I ever ask you to build me a castle? Well, no. I'm happy to live like you must live here on earth. In a tent. And he did. His glory of the creator. Living. Under skin. In the tabernacle. And so to his surprise. David said. Oh, okay. So he made him. Some skins. And made a tent. Or a hut. And took the ark there. Almost ashamed of the glorious king he loved and he wrote and sang about. Should have to live. But God said, I'm happy. Glory inside of a frail tent. And that is what our home should be. Glory. Greatness inside of a small, frail, hurting sometimes, sick sometimes, feverish sometimes, worried sometimes, full of problems, always. Glory. Glory. That's how we can live here. Our home. Our home, inside of this weak tent, can be full of glory, full of joy unspeakable, and full of glory. I've read books written by the frailest of Christians, bedridden for 20 years in pain. And all the glory that shined from their life. Glory. No, they weren't in defeat. No, they were just living. No, they were full. It's almost like ignoring the things they were going through. Uplifting. As Paul, writing from his dark, humid, rat-infested prison with chains in his hands and feet. But inside, the glory that still shines from his tent. Yes, movable habitations that we take from place to place in life as we wander through the different stops that God has arranged for us in the wilderness. Some places of abundance, other places of lack. Some places with the bitter waters that we must drink of Mara. And other times in our life where we enjoy the soft breeze and enjoy the shadows of the palm trees of Elam. Or as we pitch our tents, preparing for battle as with Amalek. Yes, Amalek, yes, our life is a life of wandering from place to place. No, we don't have a building here. We are nomads, whether we like it or not. Even if we build a house and stay there and say, okay, my life is never going to change because I'm living in a nice house. Sorry. Life is going to change anyway. 
Because the life that has been written by God for you, you must drag your tent. Oh yes, you can put it inside of a nice house if you want, but your tent will be where God has written. It should be in this time of your life. And as you look back at the places where you have pitched your tents, as Abram, you probably left, as I have, stones that you can look back and say, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, what a beautiful time. Oh, I remember that. What a terrible time. Oh yes, I remember that one. And you can look back and see all the places you've been. You can remember the situations. But you know, you might not remember what house you were living in. What color the paint the walls was. What color the rug was or if you ever had a rug or if it was dirt on the ground. But you'll never forget the circumstances, the place where you pitched your tent. And the same we will continue until we are called to glory. We discard this tent. Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. Went out not knowing where he went. In verse 9, the second part, we read the first that says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. And it continues the second part of the verse 9. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. The tents are tents of three generations. The tent of Abraham dwelling in the tabernacle with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob that were heirs or inheritors of that same promise. So the master of the tent, the owner of the tent, the builder of a tent, the receiver of the promises are unto those that live in the tent with him. His sons, his grandsons. The Abraham tent or the tent of faith is a family tent that lasts for three generations. And when Abraham died, it was now Isaac's tabernacle. Oh, it wasn't the same tent. No, those skins, they rot. So I doubt that Isaac wanted to move in with his family into a hundred-year-old skin hut. I don't think so. Because it now was Isaac's tabernacle. And who did he dwell with? He dwelt with his sons and grandsons. And when Isaac died, it was Jacob's tent with Jacob's sons and daughters, two daughters, and his grandchildren, the children of Israel. So when Abraham died, it was Isaac. When Isaac died, it was Jacob's family. And your tent is your family's tent. And all those that are covered because they are inheritors. They are covered by your tent. Whether they physically are there or not or far away, they are inheritors of the blessings of your tent. So this next generation 
that's beginning to come in now. They will set up their own tents and be led by their God through their journey. And you'll be able, why a tent? You'll be able to do like Abram. Because God many times reminded him of what he was there for. Why he was called by God. And God said every so often, here, open the flap of your tent and look up. That's the promise. And that promise is for you, for your children, and for your children's children's, the promise. In Genesis chapter 15, 5 is when God brought him forth out of the tent and said, look now towards the heaven. Look at the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your seed be. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever had to live in an enclosed place for any length of time. But those that live in Alaska know a little bit about the depressions of life. When there's no light for several months and it gets dark, only special people can live there in Alaska. Because to live in a small, confined place, it gets frustrated sometimes. And yes, although we might live in a house with four or five bedrooms, life itself can close in on us. And it seems like we're surrounded by circumstances, by problems, pressured on every side. What's the matter? I can't stand. It's like I'm claustrophobic with all these problems. So what does God say? Come out and count the stars. Hmm. He didn't say, come out, look at the stars. Do you see them? Okay, go back in your tent. No, he said, start counting. Get away from that place. Let's leave the flaps open. Let some, let some air get in there. Get, get your bearings again. Get your life looking at what you have to look again. Get reset again. Come out and look up. And start counting. One, two, three, four, four thousand, ten thousand. What was I worried about? With all he has for me, with the inheritance that's so much that it can't be counted, and I was worried about these bills. Oh my God. I am more than conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Savior. Back in the tent I go, hallelujah. Count your blessings. Count his promises. For they are yea and they are amen. And so he counted them. And you know, When he started counting, it says, he believed. He believed. Yes, the man of faith began to believe when he looked at God's promises. The father of faith had to be checked once in a while because he didn't believe. Because the circumstances crowded his mind, shadowed his mind. When he got up one morning and, ugh, 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 I don't remember this pain before. Sarah, my, my back hurts. Well, what do you expect? You're 80 years old. 
Oh, well, I'd forgotten that. I don't feel 80 years old. What's the matter, Abraham? What you, what you doing? Get up. Oh, yeah, hand me my walking stick. I'm getting old. So even he forgot the promises that he would have someone to share his tent with, son and grandson. So God had to remind him to get out and count the stars, and he believed. And it was counted for him for righteousness. So look up to the stars like Abraham. Don't look down. Don't, don't let the clouds or storms make you run from an, for an earthly shelter. Just hunker in in your tent within the fortress of the house of the Lord. You know, as I said, if you take the ceiling off, the roof off. All you have will walls and you'll be able to look at the stars. Because so many times our securities, even in religion, even in church, our securities make us forget and stop and impede God's blessings. That sunlight and nice fresh rain and wind. Because inside a building it gets stuffy. You have to open the doors and the windows. Let Can you imagine how different it is in a tent? The roofs impede the blessings. What blessings? In Exodus 13 and verse 21... It said that when God led his people that lived in tents through the desert, he led them with a pillar of a cloud. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light to be able to go. So the cloud that led them and the fire that gave them light to know where to go. And it says, verse 22, he did not take away the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And the roof does not allow the light of God's pillar of fire to illuminate us in the darkest of nights. Because if it's dark outside. If it's dark inside of the heart. And darkness surrounds us all around. And we cannot see the cloud. Because of the roof. The cloud that will lead us. from temptations, lead us from troubles, lead us away from the enemy's attacks, lead us away from dangers. Yes, we don't need a roof in our house. All we need is just walls. Walls. Walls so that the enemy cannot reach us, so that the dangers of the world around us cannot get to us. So we must be not builders of buildings, of houses, but tent, dwell tent dwellers that build and repair walls. The walls of which we must be, Isaiah 58, 12, we must be, Builders and repairers of the walls. Watchmen on the walls. Not watchmen of the tabernacle, of the building, of the temple. 
but walls. And tent dwellers inside of those walls. Repairers. When the enemy begins to open up a hole in the wall. Create breaches to come in. As long as those walls are repaired, we are safe in our tents. Always, hmm, it's interesting. The church used to be that way. But then men begin to build and they put roofs over those walls. And it changes everything. Yes, the promise is security. Security inside of a strong building here. But you know, buildings don't last in the wars. Buildings don't stop pandemics. Buildings don't stop sickness. Nothing does. But so many times, people take refuge in a building, thinking that the building is safety. No, the building is not safety. The only safety there is, is within the walls of his fortress, in his house. Within the walls, that's his house. Setting up our lives, our tents, within his fortress. But so many times people, it sounds a little insecure. And they prefer to have a structure, structure of religion, structure of forms. But you know, I'm afraid that the next generation, you remember that song that says, it will be a dancing generation? We have sang, I think the next generation will be a camping generation. All that we have known, the security of houses, the security of structure. God is going to lead them in the way that we lived in the beginning. The way of the sojourner that follows God. Not established in a physical place where the building anchors us to a place. But they will be a camping generation. Because the buildings that man has built to try to house God that cannot be housed in the building. The time will come where the principalities and powers that already are rising and allowed to be on earth will become the destroyer of church buildings. It's happened before because they think if they can destroy a church building, they can destroy Christianity. They've always thought that. Because so many people live in the world but are Christians on Sunday. And the principalities and powers like they have throughout history and had, are doing it even right now in certain countries. They will attack the buildings. They will attack the structure. They will attack the organizations. They will just, uh, uh, attack what you can see. But God's people, this next generation, they will be taken and they will live in tents. Fragile, following God like a nomadic tribe. I think one of the last nomadic tribes we've seen, and those of you that's gone to Israel, are the Bedouin. 
tent dwellers have always been persecuted throughout history. They've tried to destroy God's people by destroying the buildings. But God's people are not building dwellers. God's people are tent dwellers that dwell and are protected by the walls of his fortress. Even prisons have not been able to stop the tent dwellers. So the next generation, don't be lulled when this storm passes, don't let your life go back to what it was before. God has been so wisely showing us. In many countries, it's like this. The churches open up a little bit, and people run back to church for security. And they say, okay, you can't go anymore to church. So people can't go to church anymore. They say, oh, I miss church, I miss the songs, I miss the preaching, I miss this, I miss that. I miss the friends, I miss this and so. Again, it opens up a little bit. If people don't go back to church, now, no, just 20 people at a time. And then they close it down again. This is happening all over the world. In fact, I was supposed to be in a, in a conference next week in Argentina. But now I can't take a chance. On a dime, they'll close everything up. But I think God is trying to show us something. Church, the building, the structure is not supposed to be for you. Yes, you can be there when it opens. It's fine. It's wonderful. But start living the tent life, which is you, your family, and God. So that if the time comes that there's no building to go from, they haven't taken away your God. Because your God is in your tent with you. And wherever you might be, that's where God is. And that's where you and your family are safe because he is with you. Hallelujah. Father, make your people in these times of such disruption, dis disruption, to be able to understand what you are trying to tell us. That our life is in you, as we sang. Our hope is in you. Our strength is in you. Not in things that this world may offer. Not the security that lands or possessions may try to give us. But you have called us to be sojourners with you, tent dwellers. Thank you for those promises that you give to the tent masters. Those promises that those tents and stakes will be extended as far away as family might be because they are included in your blessings. They will one day abide in a heavenly tent not frail, not made of skins, but a mansion where you will keep families together as you have promised. 
So Lord, I extend the stakes of my tent. And look up to the stars and remind myself that what you have promised will be. That not one star will fall from the heaven of the words that you have spoken. You are our life, our hope, our fortress, our strong refuge in times of need. Bless your people, Lord. Bless me, my family. Bless the families of this church family. Bless the families of the extended church families in the big tent of the world that are your people bless them encourage them those that are in trials or tribulations or sickness or pain let them be strengthened in the strength of the Lord let fear not dwell in our tents but let faith sustain us every day of our life as we follow you let no roof hide your cloud that leads us let no roof come between the light of the fire that you place to guide us. But let us have a clear view of the sky, a clear view of your house, a clear view of our direction and decisions we must take, that we know not what to do unless we have a cloud to follow. So give us an unobstructed view of the pillar of light and the cloud of guidance that we might be led by your word, that we might see your promises fulfilled. In Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. If you want to be able to see the stars in all their clarity, and to recall and feel the life of those promises, you cannot just run out from your abode. If you live in a city, the lights hide the stars. The things so brightly lit of this world 
that distract us so much. You get out of your tent and you look up and your eyes are blinded. But if you wait, if you just wait, if you just look with expectancy and wait, your pupils will begin to adjust and the stars will begin to appear. Or even better, get away from the city. When I was in Spain, I went to the mountain and the night came. Oh, there were so many stars. Or even here when I go to Hebron, the sky is full of stars. And as I come back to the lights of Atlanta, you can see less and less and less. You can see the moon, maybe one north star strong. So take time. Maybe you have to just get away from the strong lights that blind you. If you can't see God, if you can't feel God, if you can't remember who you are, get away from those lights. Just go quiet. Let your eyes and your heart adjust. And you'll see the stars. And you'll hear the stars. Did you know that the stars speak? They do more than that. They sing words. Because it's written, from the very beginning of creation, the stars sang. And if in the midst of the darkness you might be in, you just go out. Go out. Get away from the city. Get away from the building. Get away from the roof. Go up to the mountain. And your eyes will begin to say, oh, I remember. There's a star there. There's another. There's another. Oh, yes. Everything's not bad. Everything's okay. Yes, God's promises. I remember. I remember now. And if you stay a little longer, you will hear inside a singing. Beautiful singing that will appease your heart and your soul and fill you with peace that you'll be able to go back and confront whatever troubles await you with the stars still singing in your heart. So look at the stars until you're starstruck and alive again. Amen. Go with God.